everybody. It's so good to be back. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. What a beautiful room. Isn't it beautiful? Look at you all up there. Uh, I'm going to do a talk about how to craft a product story that sells. Uh, sales is hard. Selling stuff is hard. When you talk to, particularly in tech, uh, with startups, people talk a lot about how hard it is to sell stuff. We're kind of product people. A lot of founders come from the product side of the house. Selling is really hard, but we have to figure out how to do it. Otherwise, we don't get to stay in business. That's how we all make money. Um, but today, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the reverse of that or the customer's perspective of that. And I'm going to say something maybe a little controversial, which is buying is hard. Now, yeah, people are laughing. Yeah, sure, buying is hard. I wish that was my job, and all I had to do all day was buy stuff. Buying's really hard, yeah. And it, here's what we don't often think about when we think about that. Um, some stuff is really fun to buy, and most of the things that we think are fun to buy are what we call an unconsidered purchase, like a pack of gum or a beer in the bar, or a pair of shoes, or a t-shirt. You walk in, you buy it, oh, I kind of like this, I buy it. It's no big deal. If I pick the wrong one, no big deal. I just don't buy that one again. It's not a big deal. Then there are things that are a considered purchase, and a considered purchase is way less fun. It's like buying a car. Is that fun? No, it's not fun. You gotta research it, you're looking at all the different, maybe it's fun if you're super rich, but it, you know, it, you're researching it, you're looking at all the things, you're like, oh, I don't wanna buy the wrong car, I'm gonna be stuck with this car forever. Most of the things that we sell in B2B are a highly considered purchase, and these are no fun to buy. Let's think about how a buying process starts. So let's say uh, your product is accounting software. And so, the, you know, how does somebody buy accounting software? Here's what happens. The vice president of finance or something wakes up in the morning and she says, do you know what sucks? The way we do our books, it's terrible. I hate it. We need some new software to fix that. Does she go and buy? No, she's busy. She's got stuff to do. She goes to the office and she looks around the office and says, you, John, fix this shit. Like, we need, we need better accounting software. I hate the way this works. Go figure it out. And what does John feel? Terror. That's what he feels, terror. He's like, oh, no. Now I'm going to be, oh, no. And, and what does John know about accounting software? Nothing. Maybe he's used accounting software a little bit. He doesn't know who the vendors are in accounting software. He doesn't know what the state of the art of accounting software is. He doesn't know what's good or what's bad. And there's stakes here. He doesn't want to get it wrong. Because if he picks the wrong one, what happens? He gets in trouble with his boss. He looks like an idiot. All the people in the department that have to use the accounting software, they hate his guts because he bought that stupid thing. Maybe he gets fired. This could be a total disaster. So he's like, OK, I better do a good job on this. So what do I do? I Google. And what do I get? 9,000 products, 900 million products, and they all look the same. And so I look at G2 Crowd and Software Advice and all these places that have all these reviews. And even if I only look at the ones in the top right corner, there's still way too many. There's dozens of them. It's awful. Everyone's talking about features. I have nothing. That I, I don't know what any of them are. The first thing I have to do before I even pick one is make a short list. How do I do that? I don't even know what's important to me and what isn't important to me. And maybe, maybe I get all the way through this process and and I actually fill out a form and say, please give me a demo on your website. And then I go and I get a call with your sales rep. And what does your sales rep do? He makes it even worse. He just, he says, great, oh great, glad you're here. Let me give you the feature walkthrough. Here's a feature, here's a feature, here's another feature. Did I mention we have features? All kinds of features. Here's another feature, here's another feature, here's another feature. Your hair is blowing back. You're like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what any of these things are and I don't know what's important and I don't know what's not important. Buyers are drowning in information that they can't make sense of. And if we understand this, then it is not a surprise that 40% of B2B software purchase processes end in no decision. 
Do you know why? Because John looks at all this stuff, sits on a bunch of sales calls, gets totally freaked out, goes back to his boss and says, you know what, all the accounting packages suck. They all suck, they're too complicated, they're too expensive, and you know what's good? The one we got right now. We should just keep using the one we got. He's not getting in trouble for picking the one you have right now. That's fine, that's fine. There's no risk in that. So, people can't figure out what to do, and so the easiest path is to just do nothing. Now, What's really interesting is if you look at the research on this, like what do buyers actually want from us, vendors? What do they want? And in particular, what do they want in a sales meeting? What, what does John wish happened in a sales meeting? If you look at the data on this, what they want is insight on the market. What they want is a way to make decisions and trade-offs. I'm looking at 9,000 things. Can I put them in the buckets? When should, there's all these different approaches. Should I do this one or this one? They want to avoid mistakes. Are we actually giving them that? No. No, we're not. Like, what customers don't want is a product sales pitch. What they actually want is market insight. They want a way to make decisions that they feel confident about. They want to be able to justify it to their boss. Go back to the office and said, I picked this one for this reason. I'm going to give you an example of how this works, because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, my product's not that bad, actually, April. You know, my product's fine. Everybody knows what my product's about. You know, we, don't, we don't have that problem. So let me give you the dumb example. This is the example is called April Buys a Toilet. Hmm. Oh, you didn't think we were talking about toilets today. We are. Um, so, so, this is, so I bought a house, a really old, crappy house in Toronto, where I live. Uh, and it has a bathroom, and it's not nice, so I hire a guy, and he's going to fix my bathroom. So the guy comes, he's fixing the bathroom, and he says, uh, you're going to need a new toilet, so uh, just, just go to the store and pick out what toilet you want. I'm like, okay, how hard can that be? It's just a toilet, right? So I go to the toilet store, and it, it's... it's it's a nightmare. So I, I walk into the toilet store, and a guy comes and says, can I help you? And I said, yes, I'm here to buy a toilet. And he says, what kind of toilet do you want? I don't know, man. I never bought a toilet. I don't know anything about toilets. You're supposed to tell me. And then he says, well, there's the toilet section. All the toilets are over there. And they've all got prices and the descriptions. You go over there, browse around. And then once you decide what you want, you come and talk to me. Okay, so I go over and I look and there's all these descriptions and all these features that I don't know anything about and they're talking about flappers and skirts and things and I, I don't know what any of them are and some of the toilets are really, really cheap and some are very expensive and I can't tell the difference between them and so I freak out. I'm like, I don't know how to buy a toilet. I can't even have a conversation with the toilet guy. I gotta go home and research this. So I go home and I get on the internet and I go on this thing called Consumer Reports and they don't recommend one toilet. No, they have dozens of toilets and then they have dozens of feature categories about toilets and I'm supposed to learn about all of these and there's so many things you'd never know. There's like water efficiency and single flush and dual flush technology and seat height. I thought they were all the same. And then there was flappers and flappers and skirted things. And then I found out the most terrifying thing, like the worst thing I found out about toilets. There's this thing, it's called a, it's called a MAP score. And that's the amount of solid waste that a toilet can handle. And 300 to 600 grams is good, but some models can handle up to 1,000 grams. Gross. Now I know stuff about toilets I don't want to know. I'm like, I'm too busy for this. I don't want to know this stuff. I don't want one, one neuron in my brain occupied with any of this. There must be a guy out there that'll tell me what toilet to buy, like the Gartner group of toilets. That should exist, right? So I Google and I find this guy. He's called <laughs> Terry Love, and he writes a newsletter called Terry Loves Toilets. I can't make this up because this is true. But even he doesn't give me one toilet. He gives me a dozen toilets, and it's so technical, I can hardly even stand it. He's a toilet weirdo, and he's got a thing on there that says, below are my recommendations for toilets that are water efficient, gravity flush made assisted, PF2, whisper vac, GVAC. I'm like, ah, this is awful. So then I get a bright idea. You know what? 
Maybe I don't have to buy a toilet at all. Mm -hmm. I'm smart. Maybe we keep the old one. So I go back to the house, and I have the guy fixing the toilet, and I said, look, I got a great idea. Let's just keep the toilet we got. Seemed to be working okay. Let's forget about the new toilet. We'll just keep that one until it breaks, and then we'll figure out something. And he says, lady, no, we recycled it. It's gone. It's been gone for a week. Like, you need to go. And I'm like, gonna have a bathroom without a toilet. So I had, to, I had to like bring the kids in. I'm like, hey kids, you know how the dog goes in the backyard? We're all going in the backyard now. No, of course not. Now I'm like, oh crap. I'm gonna have to go back to the toilet store. So I go back to the toilet store and I meet this guy and his name's Lou. Yeah, see, that's funny. Um, so his, and, and I walk in, and I'm on a, like, I can't leave this store without a toilet. So I walk in, he comes over, he says, can I help you? And I said, yes, you can. I can't leave this store without a toilet. And I hate shopping for toilets. He's like, it's terrible, isn't it? I'm like, yeah. And he says, too many choices. I'm like, yeah. And he says, look, 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 it's actually easy. Let me explain it to you. See, that side, all the toilets are expensive. That side, the toilets are cheap. Yeah, why is that? He goes, well... This is for your not primary toilet. So maybe you got a toilet in a vacation home or a toilet in a, in a room you never use or something, and they hardly ever get flushed. So you can buy a cheaper one and it doesn't wear out, it's fine. And is this a primary toilet or a not primary toilet? I said, this is definitely a primary toilet. Okay, forget about those. Don't look at those. Great. Okay, so now we're just looking at these. He says, see those ones at the back? Yeah, these are fashion toilets. Some of them are gold and they have, you know, fashion things. Do you have any fashion requirements for your bathroom? Absolutely not. I say, good, forget about those. Now we're, now we're getting somewhere. We're down to like 10 toilets or something. And he says, look, the only difference between these ones here is some have the bowl in the wall and some don't. And I'm like, why would you put the bowl in the wall? He says, if you're space constrained, it's smaller if you put the bowl in the wall. But the problem is, if it breaks and you need to fix it, it's better if the bowl is outside of the wall. So if you have space for the outside of the wall bowl, you should do that. I'm like, I got lots of space. Let's get one of those. Good. Now I'm down to two toilets. They're both the same brand. They're both Toto toilets. One's a little more expensive, one's cheaper. And the guy says, look, I got a convection to make. I actually work for Toto. That's all right. <laughs> actually, what I said was, I said, no shit. And he said, we don't use that word, ma'am. <laughs> it's solid waste. Okay, sorry. And, and, uh, and he said, but you know, he said, but honestly, either one of these is good. One's a little bit more expensive, one's less. I said, what would you pick? He said, well, the one that's a little more expensive, slightly better parts. If it was me, I would spend the extra, pick that one, never think about toilets again. I'm like, you're talking my language. So I bought that thing and then that was it. No regrets, I feel really good about that. What happened there? That guy helped me make sense of the entire market. That guy, even though he was biased, even though he was gonna make more, if I picked a more expensive toilet, even though he wanted me to pick that toilet right from the beginning, he made the whole market make sense so that I can make a choice that I feel totally good about and I could come back and if anyone were ever to say, why'd you pick that one? I could tell you this story I told you right now and justify why I made the purchase. Now let's think about this. If it's that hard to buy a toilet, how hard is it to buy your stuff? Like, we know what toilets are. We are all toilet users, right? But you're selling to people that maybe have never even used your stuff before. You've got way more complicated things. You've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analysis, blah, blah stuff. It's super hard to buy your stuff. Wickedly, wickedly awful hard to buy your stuff. And so I think the way we get around this is we stop thinking like we're salespeople, and we have to start thinking more like we're a guide. What we really want to do is help people make sense of the whole market so they can make their own choices and feel good about their choices. Um, and people will say, oh, but we can't do that. We're biased. Everybody will know. And it's, yes, we are. And you know what? Everybody knows we are. I, I didn't care that Lou was biased. I just wanted the story. And I actually feel pretty good that if I had, a, if it wasn't my primary toilet, it was my secondary, I would have bought one of the cheap ones and I would have felt good about that too. So we know a lot about solutions. We spend all day thinking about the market and thinking about solutions. Customers don't, they're experts in problems. So why wouldn't we share our expertise with them? We actually have exactly what they want, which is, a point of view on the market. So this really isn't about trashing the competition. It's not about saying, oh, they're terrible and we're good. 
It's about saying, look, it's our point of view on the market that these kind of things are good for this and these kind of things are good for this and we're particularly good for this, you decide. So how do we actually build a story that does that? Can we build a story that sells? Um, it, now, here, here's where this gets kind of tricky. So if you come from the marketing side of the house and we talk about storytelling, all the marketers have learned this thing called uh, uh, Hero's Journey. There's a very popular book with the marketers right now called Building a Story Brand, and it's about how to use this hero's journey story structure. It's like we have a, 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 a main character who goes on, who has some kind of a problem, and they go on a quest, and they meet a guide that's you, and the, the, the guide helps them, and then they have a solution to their problem, and then it all ends happily ever after. It's been designed for movie scripts and books and things like that. It's specifically oriented for entertainment. The problem with that structure, though, is it doesn't give us a way to have this conversation about there's all kinds of choices, and actually lots of these choices are good in lots of different ways. I can't have a conversation about the market and and trade-offs with this structure. Works good if I'm doing a customer case study, other things, forget it. Sales, no. Um, the second structure we have is the one that probably most of your sales reps are using, which is the features, features, features pitch. Let me just give you a product walkthrough, show you all the features. The problem with that is all the work is on the customer to figure out why those features matter and whether or not those features are differentiated from other companies. They don't know if it's table stakes or not. They don't know if everybody has this same feature or not. So this doesn't work either. All it does is put more work on the customer. The customer's already got too much work. The last one that I see sometimes is what I'll call the vision pitch. Now, this is what the, the founders are generally pitching to the VCs or investors. And the investor pitch is all about the future. This is the vision. This is where we're going. This is where we're going to be in five years, 10 years. It's going to be amazing, all singing, all dancing. It's fantastic. The problem is you can't pitch that in sales because it's too far in the future. In B2B, if you do that in sales, all you're doing is giving the customer an excuse to delay purchase. They say, oh, I love, I love it. I love that thing you're talking about. Come back in two years when you have it, right? No, buyers will not exchange today's money for tomorrow's product. So what I really need is a pitch that helps me communicate this point of view on the market, but is really oriented in today. What can I do for you today? Better than anybody else, today. Um, I call this a point of view pitch. And the point of view pitch does a bunch of things. Um, it starts with our insight into the market. Like, what do we know that other people don't know? How can I get the customer to think about the market in the way we think about the market? It acknowledges that they have choices. And you know what? Some of those choices might be better for a particular kind of customer. And it acknowledges that. And what it does is it, it helps them understand when they should pick us and why they should pick us. I'm going to give you an example, then I'm going to teach you how to build this. So here's the first example. It's a company I love. They're called Help Scout. They're in an absolutely terrible market. It's the customer service market or the help desk software market. Um, and so let's start with their positioning. So really, if we're going to build a good story around this, we've got to start with our positioning. So who's their competition? There's m 9 million help desk software vendors on the planet, thousands of them, actually. The num but the number one is Zendesk. That's the gorilla in the market. Everybody's going to compare you against Zendesk. Then we say, OK, that's the alternative, too. Uh, what are our differentiators? They've got a really long, long list of features that they do that are differentiated from Zendesk. And most of them are around, um, like they do, for example, they don't assign a customer a ticket. You're a person in, in Help Scout, and you get assigned a person, and you work together until your problems are solved. There's a shared inbox so that the right uh, rep gets matched with the right customer coming in. There's things like um, they have, they let the customer pick which channel they want to be served at. So if you want to do it in chat, you can do it in chat. You want to do it over the phone, we'll do it over the phone. You like email, we'll let you do email. So they have a long list of features. Now, those are just the features. And then you say, so, well, so what? What is the value of these features? All of this coming together really is all about delivering amazing customer service. That's really Help Scout's jam. It's all about amazing customer service. 
Is that different than Zendesk? Heck yeah. Zendesk is all about reducing costs in the customer service function. Really different. Um, so let's think about this. Who cares? Not every customer cares about that. So if you're a great big telco service thing, you don't care actually about delivering amazing customer service. Everybody's on a contract. You got them. All you, what you really want is you want to get people off of there. You want them to go to the FAQ. You want them to stop mucking up with your customer service. You're trying to reduce costs. Who doesn't care about that? Who actually cares about delivering amazing customer service? Well, it turns out a lot of new direct-to-consumer online brands, e-commerce brands, care a lot about that because it's the only time they get to interact with their customer. And the data shows that if you interact with them well in customer service, it actually really drives up uh, customer happiness, customer retention. Um, customers come back to you over and over again, and it ultimately drives growth. So that's the positioning. Right? So how do we do the story? If I call Help Scout and get on the phone with them, do I get a feature walkthrough? No, I don't. I get a story that looks a bit like this. People get on the phone and they say, they start with this concept of customer service is a growth driver. So they start with, hey, we work with a lot of businesses like you in e-commerce, direct to consumer, and you know what? We've seen that customer service is a growth driver. Here's the data we've got on it. You know, you do deliver better, better customer service, better retention, more repeat buyers. Let's look at the alternatives. Zendesk, they're gonna give you a number. Is that good customer service? They're gonna drive you to a chat bot and there isn't even a person there. Is that good? They're trying to get you to the FAQ. Is that good? Most help desk software is all about reducing costs. It is not about customer service. Um, and so if you think that customer service and your reputation is important, then we're the right choice for you. Now let me show you the demo. Let me show you how we actually do that. And then I show you the shared inbox, all the other things we do. Now my differentiated capabilities are now in the context of the value that it creates for customers. So this kind of a pitch transforms here's what I built into here's why I built it. Um, so how do we actually do this? We can actually break this out into a structure. So the structure looks a little bit like this. There's a setup, and it doesn't have to take all day, but what I'm doing is giving you a bit of context, and it starts with my specific insight on the problem. So in Help, Help Scout's case, it's this idea that great customer service can, can improve revenue. Then I show you what the other folks do, and I highlight the gap. And then I say, look, if you really want to fill this gap, we're the folks for you and then I show you how we do it. Now, a good pitch starts with good positioning. You didn't think the positioning lady would come up here and not talk about positioning, did you? So we can't do this unless we really deeply understand our positioning. We have to understand, first of all, what are the alternatives to what we do, including direct competition, but also status quo, because we know we lose 40% of our deals to that. So we have to position against the Excel spreadsheet or the intern or whatever else. We need to deeply understand that first. Then we need to understand what are the capabilities that we have that the other alternatives don't, and we need to translate that to value. So what? We have all these capabilities, so what? What does it mean for the customer? And then importantly, we need to understand which customers actually really care a lot about that. And that's where the magic happens. I got this value, I got these people that really, really care a lot. Um, once we have that, then we can actually map those components of the positioning directly into the sales pitch. So let me give you another example. This is a company, I love them. They're in the... Um, sales enablement space. They're called Level Jump. So quickly, through the positioning. So uh, who's their competitor? Well, it's all the other people that do sales enablement. It's terrifying, it's awful. There's basically three competitors. Either you put everything on a shared drive, or uh, you take the sales materials, you put it in a CMS, or you put it in a full-blown LMS, like a learning management system, and you make a course, and people can get certified on the course, and things like that. What does Level Jump have that the other ones don't have? They only have one thing, really. And what it is, is they're built on top of Salesforce. So what that means is they can take your training, sales training data, 
and map it to your sales data. Well, so what? What's the value of that? Well, the value is I can tell whether or not the training worked. Did it decrease the time to first deal? Did it decrease the time to make quota? That's the value. Who cares about that? Well, if you're hiring a lot of sales reps, you care a lot. If you don't hire many new sales reps, then you care less. Now, how does the story map out? Um, here's the old story, here's the new story. The old story was, okay, we're logging in. Here's how we set up the training. Here's how we distribute the training. Let me show you a bunch of things that all of my competitors do. And then in the very last, last five minutes of the thing, you say, oh yeah, by the way, here's how you measure the results of your training. So they're a big differentiator buried at the end. Here's the new pitch. The new pitch starts with this. Hey, I'm talking to the head of sales enablement. Hey, head of sales enablement. It's really important that we do sales enablement well, right? Why? because every day that our reps don't make quota costs us money. And the head of sales and maintenance says, yeah, you're right. How much money? I can show you. Here's my graph, a lot of money. And so look at all the other sales enablement things out there. I could do a CMS, I could put it on a shared drive, I could use a learning management system. None of those are gonna tell me whether or not my sales enablement worked, right? Don't you wish you had that? They do it in 90 seconds, that setup. And then they do the pitch. And the pitch is focused solely on that differentiated value. End of the story is they got acquired by Salesforce. Last thing before I go, how does the story get translated beyond sales? So I've been talking about a sales pitch, but this story actually drives a lot of the things we're doing in marketing. If you look at Level Jump's webpage, it's all about outcome-based sales enablement. What's the ROI of sales enablement? These are the set of numbers that we can actually move, improve time to first deal, improve time to make quota. All these things are oriented around this story and this one bit of value that they can drive that no one else can. They've also done an amazing job of helping customers understand the entire uh, market, which is horrifying. There's so much sales technology. They did this one, which is like, they, they made it like the map in a shopping mall. So, you know, here's the different levels on a mall, and floor one is sales engagement. And we're not that. Here's the vendors that are in sales engagement. engagement. Floor two is corporate learning. That's different. And if you want to have corporate learning too, that's fine. You know, pick the Chabo. That's fine. They're a great company. They're in there. But if what you really want is sales enablement, well, there's two approaches to that. There's a content management system or there's sales readiness. And oh, look, level jumps in there, along with two other competitors. What are they doing here? They're giving you the short list. They're teaching you how to think about the whole market and saying, look, put us on the short list with those other two. We're gonna beat the pants off them once you get us in a sales meeting because we know we can do that. Um, here's another example, and I like this one a lot. So they created this bit of content and it went viral and even their competitors were sharing it because it was such a nice way to think about the whole market. So it's like sales tech explained using donuts. And so they put all the categories there. Like, what is sales intelligence? I know who likes the donuts. And here's three vendors that do that. Um, what's the sales engagement? platform, I manage how often I call and email people that like donuts. Here's some examples of the vendors. If you go way down, there's one called Sales Readiness Enablement, and it says, I train to be the master at selling donuts. And again, here's three vendors that do that. You want a short list? I just gave you one. So that's it. Here are the key takeaways. One, um, buying is hard. Uh, two, uh, what we really want to do is um, communicate our point of view on a market. Good point of view starts with good positioning. And yeah, if you ever need to buy a toilet, you should just buy a Toto toilet. Thanks. Thank you, April. Thanks to your talk. I now know which kind of toilet I should buy. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention and all your good questions. The first one, if it remains 15 minutes, so we've got time for that. Great. Yep. No. What's the role of a product marketer regarding salesperson in the creation of a pitch? Is he slash she a facilitator or does he make decisions? Yeah. So, um, in my opinion, Product marketing has two main things they need to be really, really concerned about. 
The first one is positioning. That is the main thing. You need to deeply understand who do we compete with, how are we different, what is the value we can deliver that no one else can, who are the best fit target customers for this, what is the market we're going to win. You need to be driving that effort in the company to figure that out and make sure that we have that really, really tight. Now, doing positioning is not going to happen if you try to do it alone as the product marketer. This has to be done with a cross-functional team, in my experience. So you need to be the person that gets together sales, marketing, product, customer success, whoever the executives are that need to be in the room. When I do this stuff, we always have the CEO. And we're figuring out positioning together because there's no way you're going to be able to execute on positioning if we don't get everybody in agreement and alignment about what it is. Now, once we have positioning, then the next biggest job you have as a product marketer is to make sure that we execute on that positioning. And the sales pitch is super, super critical for that. If we don't, then what happens is we do all this great stuff on the marketing side, we throw it over to sales and they just make stuff up. They just do whatever they think they should do. And I'll tell you, salespeople are not trained how to build a pitch. I've done all the sales training. I've read all the sales book. Nowhere in there do they teach you how to build a pitch. But here's the other thing. If you go to your sales team that has a pitch that they're already using, even if it's terrible, even if every rep is using a different pitch, and you just walk in, brand new product marketer, and you say, hey, I'm going to help you change the pitch. They're going to say, no, you're not. No, you're not. Because sales loves the pitch they already have because they're comfortable with it. So you're never going to make that happen. But if what we're actually doing is a positioning exercise, if we start there, we make an adjustment to the positioning, and we involve sales in that exercise, then the obvious next step is that product marketing and sales should then work together on the pitch that represents that positioning. So for me, when I was a practicing product manager inside tech companies, I wouldn't go straight at the pitch. I would actually go at the positioning first, I would make sure sales was involved, and then I'd say, look, we, my, we need to have a sales story that maps to this, right? And I wouldn't do it on my own, I'd do it with the salespeople, with their involvement. So that's the practicality of how that works. Like, it's very, very hard to come in and get a team to stop using the pitch that they're using right now, unless there's a big reason to do it. A shift in positioning is typically a good reason to go get it done. It's I don't know if that answers it. I hope so. Next question mm. from a famous chief product officer in Paris. I won't do any name dropping right here. But <laughs> what is the downside of this point of view pitch? Who is it not for? Yeah, so my, um, my expertise is really, really, really B2B. And so I'm really, uh, my whole background and all the companies I've worked for has really been around this considered purchase. And so if you have something that's not a considered purchase, like, you know, consumer packaged goods things and a lot of B2C things, even B2B things sometimes where it's really low price point and individuals buy it with their own credit card. I don't know how that works. I actually don't know. And, but I will tell you one thing. I think positioning matters less in those situations. I think distribution matters a lot more. Are you in the place when the person has the thought about buying this thing, are you easy to get to, and things like that. And I think there's a lot more, you know, earlier this morning we were talking about emotions and using emotions. Um, you can make a lot more emotional purchases when, they're, when it's unconsidered, because I don't have to justify it to anybody. It's not that we don't make emotional decisions in B2B, we absolutely do. Um, but I can't just be based on my emotions, because I can't go to my boss and say, Oh, I want to buy this thing because I love that blue. I just love it. You know, I just love their website and the way they talk. It's just so nice. You know, like you can't say that to your boss, even if it's true. You need to have a story to tell your boss in order to get the budget to do it. So I don't think this works, or I don't know if it does, and I would never try to represent that it does, over on the 
unconsidered purchase side of the house, I, I don't know. I think it's different over there, and I don't, I don't know about anything over there, so if you're doing B2C, you should not listen to me. You should not take any advice from me. Thank you, April. <laughs> <laughs> what are the signs we should invest time and resources into positioning? And the second one, how do you convince a CEO to do it? Yeah, so um, I'm going to start with how do you convince the CEO to yeah. do it, because I'm an expert at this. Um, so, uh, so, uh, before, so I'm a consultant now, and I work with companies, um, and I just do positioning work just for B2B tech companies. But before that, I spent 25 years as a repeat vice president of marketing at a series of seven startups. At every one of those startups, our positioning was terrible, and I had to convince the CEO that we had to look at it and then fix it. And um, the thing that you cannot do is you cannot walk into the CEO's office and say, your positioning, which by the way, you founder built, is terrible and stupid, your baby is ugly, let's fix it. You'll just get fired. That's how that story ends. So that, that's not a way to do it. Um, but here's what does work. Uh, if the positioning, so when I came in, everybody would want me on the first week of my job as vice president of marketing to just go drive a bunch of leads and do lead generation, wave your magic marketing wand, make all the business happen. And so I would not want to do that until I was sure the positioning was good first, because otherwise we're just pouring water into a leaky bucket. So what I would do is I would go to sales, because if the positioning is weak, it's very easy to see it in sales. And so I would sit in on sales calls and you hear the signs of weak positioning right away. So what happens is customer would call in and your sales pitch, your salesperson is doing a pitch and they get halfway through and you can see the customer go, wait, 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 back up and start from the beginning. What is it again? So you're what? And you can see this, they can't even figure out what it is, let alone, that's, that's sign number one, the positioning's weak. Sign number two is the customer comes in and says, yeah, yeah, I get what you are. You're just like Salesforce. And you're nothing like Salesforce. And you're like, shoot, we got it. We're, that's bad. Or the worst one is when they say, oh, I get it. I, I get what you are. I just don't see why anybody would pay for that. Like, why wouldn't I just do that with a spreadsheet? Like, I could just do that with my accounting package. Why would I buy you? So all these things are signed that the positioning is weak. So if I saw that, then I would go out for lunch with the VP sales and say, look, I've been hanging out with your folks, and here's what I see. Do you see that? People are confused. Like, it takes two or three sales calls before the light comes on. Do you see that? And if that's true, the VP sales knows it. He might not know that that's positioning, but he knows it. And so we have this lunch conversation and say, I, has anybody here, have we ever done a positioning exercise? And the answer is always no. No, we haven't. Well, maybe we should. Like maybe the positioning's okay, but why don't we just check in on it? That maybe that's what's going on here. I do that with sales, so that I get VP sales on board. Then I go to head of product and do the same thing. Hey, I was over in sales and I've been hearing this stuff. Do you see that when you're out talking to customers? They don't really get what we are. They're comparing us with Salesforce. Like, why are they doing that? That's weird, right? So then I'd have that conversation. Then I would go to the CEO and I'd say, look, I don't know anything. I'm new. I know nothing. But I'm sitting over in sales, and I keep hearing these questions, and I don't know if the positioning is good or bad, but I think it would be a worthwhile thing for us to get the gang together and walk through a process. Maybe the positioning comes out the same, and it's fine, but maybe it's not, and maybe we could fix it. And you know what the CEO says? What does John in sales think? I'm like, I don't know. Call him. And then he calls, and goes, yeah, I've been thinking about this, you know. But I've already got everybody else on the team by the time I go to the CEO. That's how you convince the CEO. You don't go there first. If the positioning's bad, sales feels it, product feels it. If you can't convince them, maybe the positioning's fine. Maybe you're the problem. But if I can convince them to at least look at it, then we look at it. Now, here's the trick. Now we're going to go look at it. We cannot get a cross-functional team together and look at positioning without a process. Because what will happen is, I've got sales, marketing, product, 
customer success, I got the founders, we're all together in a room. If we don't have a process, what happens is someone says, well, look, why does everyone love our stuff? And then it just becomes a battle of opinion. And you know who's who never wins the battle of opinions? Product marketing. We never win the battle. It's, it becomes sales versus the founder, and they fight, and then whoever's loudest wins. Does that make it right? No. So if we have a process, then we can say, look, like, we, let's try to take the opinions out of it. Let's start with who do we compete with? Let's get an agreement on that. And then how are we different? Well, let's get agreement on that. And then let's translate that to value. Hmm, often what we get to if we do it that way is really different. So anyway, that's my advice. So that's how you convince a CEO. What was the other one? What should we be? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. There was two. There was how do you convince your CEO and what should, what, what's the most yeah. important thing for us to focus on? What are the sign we should invest time and resources into positioning? Oh, for positioning. Um, so, the, so there's a bunch of things. So one is, um, uh, so a lot of product marketers that I talk to are doing things to try to gather information about customers. And I think you need, for positioning work, you need to be really careful about this. So when I started this kind of work back when I was an employee. I was always running surveys with customers and trying to figure out things like, what do we get compared to? So my very first job, I ran this survey because I wanted to see, you know, was our competition really what we thought it was? So I ran a survey and I surveyed everybody and I said, if you didn't use us, what would you be using? And customers responded and what I got was absolute garbage. There was like a thousand different answers and there was no pattern. I, like I plotted it in a bar chart and there was just bars going all across it was really awful and I was sitting at my desk looking at this feeling angry and my CEO walked by the founder walked by and he says what, what you doing here and I said well I ran this survey and this is what people think they would use if we didn't exist and he looks at it and he says who said that you know he points at one of the things what kind of what dumb customer thinks we compete with that and I, I don't know so I pull out the spreadsheet and I said Bank of Montreal he goes oh we hate Bank of Montreal. They are our worst customer. We sold them three years ago when our product was totally different. They do a totally weird thing with our product. No one else will ever do that thing again. If I could reverse time, I would never have closed that deal. We have to keep servicing them. But I don't want our positioning to reflect what they think at all. Take them out. And then he, then I, he, then he, then he gets all mad. He's like, show me the spreadsheet. And he goes down the spreadsheet and he crosses off like, 20 customers, nope, 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 nope. These are all weird, take them off. And the funny thing is, when I reran the graph, now I could see the pattern. So when we're thinking about positioning, I think it's actually really important to separate out good fit customers from bad fit customers, because we care a lot about good fit customers. I'm trying to have positioning that fills a pipeline full of good fit customers. And you're gonna have some edge case customers that frankly, they're not good fit. Like, yes, they bought your stuff, but they're gonna churn eventually. They're not happy. They're using you for some weird thing there, you know? And so I have to be very careful if I'm gonna go collect data as a product marketer, that I'm making sure that data makes sense and I'm not trying to treat all customers as equal because they are not. So I have, doesn't really answer that question, but I wanted to have that little speech anyway. So that's what I did. But Thank you very much, April. Okay. We, we ran, off, ran, ran out of time, but okay. I've got one last one because okay. it's super related to your talk. Okay. How did you make Barack Obama follow your Twitter account? Barack Obama does not follow my Twitter account. He does? Is that actually true? I, I bet it's Barack Obama's uh, uh, social media manager follows my Twitter account, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I don't was know. logged into the wrong. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That would be amazing, and I have no idea how I did that. I did not meet Barack Obama. I have nothing to do with Barack Obama. But it wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't have a marketer on his team that came across my stuff at some point, and that's usually how that happens. We'll double check that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I right. have two more things to add. The first one, okay. another round of applause for okay. April, please. <laughs> <laughs>